could have been a dream end to a fantastic family holiday, but the dream became a nightmare after a wrong turn on a deadly mountain road in Oregon. I said, we've been driving for a really long time. And I knew that something was very, very wrong. The Kim family was stranded in the wilderness, and no one knew where they were. The Kim family disappeared more than a week ago. Their mysterious disappearance captivated America. James Kim and his family disappeared while returning from a Thanksgiving road trip to the Northwest. And somewhere in Oregon, a family of four is now missing with very few clues. They were out of food, fuel, and hope. My job was to keep myself and the children alive. Neither of us had any idea how long a baby could live. It was terrifying. This is survival. Maybe we're all going to live. Maybe we're all going to die. America's big family holiday. In late November 2006, James and Katie Kim were on their way home from a week's Thanksgiving break in Oregon. Their two little girls, four-year-old Penelope and six-month baby Sabine, were with them. James and I uh, traveled a lot with the children. Always going on road trips with the girls and pretty much everything was very much a family affair. On the long drive home, they decided to overnight at a boutique lodge at Gold Beach on the Pacific Coast. But it was a long, long way away. To Tim Lodge, Terry speaking. Hi, I'd like to make a reservation for one night, just one night only. When yes. Katie well, called, I asked where they were because as an innkeeper, I ask a lot of questions and I, uh, they were heading out of Portland and I knew that they had two young children. Uh, but maybe they'd be better off to find something that's right off the highway. Well, that's going to put you in a little Well, way. my concern was November, the days are short it's it we're just hard to find and i told them that it just seemed almost too much to try to get to our place that, that late hour she said leave it until daylight i ran it by james i said james she said it's very difficult to find and she advised that we actually not stay there but james was adamant rather than stop at a motel and wait for daylight he wanted to push on to the lodge at Gold Beach. He said, I would like you to call her back, and I want you to tell her that there is nothing I want more than to wake up at her inn in the morning. Yeah, we're definitely going to come tonight. They still had almost 500 kilometers to go. Another six hours at the wheel for James Kim. With a long drive ahead, Katie decided they should stop to eat. James? wanted to order french fries and I told him no because we'd been eating traveling food for so long and so I made him order a side of steamed vegetables instead of the french fries James took this photo through the restaurant window it would be a memorable family meal the last of its kind. We 
settled the children down and we just kept on driving. But they missed the turn off. we had completely missed our turn. I don't think either of us was blaming the other. It was just, we missed our turn. They could either go back 26 kilometers to the turnoff or look for another way to the coast. We felt like we had gone too far past our turn to, to turn around. We were in search of the quickest way to get to the hotel for the night. According to the map, there was a very clear cut route to the coast. It was a fateful choice. Old MacDonald's had a farm. They had unwittingly picked one of the most dangerous routes in Oregon, the so-called Bear Camp Road, a narrow 130-kilometer pass that winds through rugged wilderness. As the crow flies, it looks very short, but if you're not prepared for what's ahead of you, it can be bone rattling and frightening. It's a long, windy mountain pass. And even in the best of times, it's very treacherous. Had they mentioned where they were going, the Kims would have been warned to stay off Bear Camp Road. Never do we recommend the Bear Camp. Nor does anyone that I know of suggest to someone to go that way. Absolutely not. Its treacherous twists and turns have claimed many lives, especially in winter. All of a sudden, we're actually driving into snow. That was when we started getting very concerned. The mother of two was right to be concerned. In fact, she should have been terrified. They missed another crucial turnoff that would have led them to safety. They had veered onto a dangerous narrow logging road that should have been closed. They weren't heading for the coast, but into the depths of an Oregon wilderness that had been abandoned for the winter. There was no mobile phone coverage and no one to help them out. It didn't seem like we were getting close to the coast. The road was getting really rough. I realized that we were actually driving over big rocks. And it was very scary at that point. And I said, James, this isn't right. The road's full of rocks. We had absolutely no idea where we were. I'm calling 911. So I figured somebody would be able to tell us where we were and what was the quickest way to get out of there. You can't get any signal. Deep in the forest, far from any mobile phone coverage, they were on their own and unable to turn back. Some 
the ice. He opened his door so he could see better the side. There was a huge drop on one side of it. And it was nighttime, so we couldn't tell how far the drop was. It was a huge sigh of relief. He was back on the road, but after six hours of driving, James Kim was exhausted. It must have been about three in the morning. It was very, very late. We had been driving for a really long time. Hopelessly lost, unable to see the road ahead, they had no choice but to sit and endure the long wait for the bleak winter dawn to break. Hopelessly lost on a remote mountain track in the Oregon wilderness, James Kim, his wife Katie, and their two little girls had been forced to spend the night in their car. They were stuck at a freeway junction, and having left the motor running to stay warm, their car was almost out of fuel. It was a three-way fork. There were three choices. We didn't know the correct direction to get out. Here. We spent a lot of time studying the map. That's when we, we took a left. Where were you meant to go? We were trying to use that to determine exactly where we were located. It's just great. Yeah. I know. It was very confusing. We didn't know how to get out. I think west must be that way. We decided to stay there. We felt as though stopped at a fork in the road, we had a better chance of getting spotted. There was no doubt in our mind that we would be found. They had no idea that they were 24 kilometers down a remote logging road that was closed for winter. No one would be passing that way for another three months. Kims thought that another car would pass them soon and help them out. We had enough provisions in our car that at least we had a little bit to eat. So it wasn't awful. The sight of an open gate near their car gave them false hope that someone, probably a forest ranger, would pass by soon. About maybe a hundred feet down that road, there was a gate. And the gate was left open. And just the presence of the gate led us to believe that forest rangers did come out. I wrote stuck low on gas, low on food, two small children, please help. But no one came. Low on fuel, they endured another freezing night. Infant daughter Sabine was suffering. They were running out of nappies and food.
James wrote SOS. We were in this big clearing. We thought there was a good chance that a helicopter or an airplane would fly overhead and be able to see that. But no one was flying overhead. No one even knew they were stuck. The sunset. Despair set in. And we realized we were going to spend another night in the car. They were at the mercy of the Oregon wilderness. There was a really loud sound. And I saw bears that looked like they were heading towards us. It was terrifying. I got the baby and I zipped her up into my sweater. Bears are scared of loud noises. We were repeatedly honking the horn, honking the horn. It was another day before police were alerted to their disappearance. Alarmed that they hadn't showed up, the family house sitter in San Francisco called detectives in Oregon. Families don't simply disappear. We didn't know what provisions they had. We didn't know if they were out of food or water, or if their car had run out of gas and they no longer had the ability to heat the vehicle. We believe that they were in absolute peril. They were right. The family had spent six days in the wilderness. Suffering from hunger and extreme cold, both children were breastfed as the family's meager food supplies ran out. Then, their only source of heat also ran out. The heater ran out. You realize that your best tool for survival has failed. Without food and warmth, the outlook was grim. We felt so sorry for our children. There was only so much we could do to comfort them. Sabine's cry became very sad and very thin. It seemed like she was failing to thrive. In her weakened state, baby Sabine's core body temperature began to drop. She was at risk of developing hypothermia.
After 24 hours on the case, missing persons detective Mike Weinstein had no leads. Missing persons detective Weinstein. I received a phone call from Eva Kim, James Kim's sister. Eva was extremely distressed. She was beside herself with worry. She told me that the family had contacted the Tudatun Lodge in Goldby, Georgia. That was the first confirmation we had of an actual location that they'd been in contact with. I see it here. She was terribly concerned that something had happened to them somewhere between Portland and Gold Beach. They left from Portland. Police were overwhelmed by the scale of the search ahead of them. The area we're talking about is roughly 50 miles wide and 300 miles long. So you're talking about an area that's over 15,000 square miles. We didn't know if they ever made it to the Oregon coast. They could have been anywhere on any roadway in the state of Oregon. They could have been anywhere. With no more fuel to power the car heater, the Kims had no protection from the freezing conditions. Malnourished and exhausted, they were suffering. It was very, very cold. And the longer we went without having a solid meal, the colder it became. Katie and James Kim and their two little girls had been stranded for a week in the wilderness. Starving and freezing, their fuel had run out. It was a painful, painful type of a cold. It was so cold that we couldn't sleep because our bones ached. James would stay up and rub my feet all night because they just hurt so bad that it really would prevent us from sleeping. This is survival. Maybe we're all gonna live. Maybe we're all gonna die. Their disappearance made national news. The Kim family disappeared more than a week ago while on a road trip in the Pacific Northwest. And this morning, the police are, well, they're trying to put together new clues, trying to crack this case. But after 48 hours on the case, the police had no leads and search parties organized by family and friends found nothing. The wealthy owner of an aerospace company, James Kim's dad, Spencer, stepped in, launching three search and rescue helicopters to find his son and stranded family. Mr. Kim, he's a man of action. He makes things happen. The family was just 48 kilometers from a major motorway. But they were stuck in dense forest, and no one knew where they were. And no one knew that on the ground, a part-time search and rescue officer was passing by the very track they were stuck on. It seemed incredibly odd that an entire family of four would go missing. I was very, very scared for the kids. Bear Camp Road is infamous for people who don't know the area to take in the wintertime and get stuck. It seemed incredibly important to clear Bear Camp Road. It was the same road that the kin should have stayed on to get to the coast, but no one knew they had accidentally veered off their camp road onto a remote logging way. Snow and ice had covered their tracks, and the 
rescuer who came so close to finding them unwittingly drove right past the same track the Kims were stranded on. Just 24 kilometers up that track, an increasingly desperate James Kim tried another way to alert rescuers. I remember James saying specifically, if they won't come to rescue us, maybe they will come to rescue the forest. And that was when he had the idea. But getting the tires to burn was a long and exhausting struggle. succeeded, the smoke wouldn't rise above the trees. Uh, we were taking the children's books and we were throwing them onto the fire. When she saw that we were burning her lamb, Penelope was very upset. James said that was the sacrificial lamb. Finally, the smoke rose above the trees. We were totally triumphant. We were dancing, we were laughing, and... certain that that fire was going to get us spotted. But the elation and smoke on the ground did not reach high or wide enough. After a six-hour search, the three rescue helicopters sent in by James Kim's father didn't spot them. completely devastating. After three days, the search covering hundreds of square kilometers hadn't uncovered even a clue as to where the family was. Then, a possible breakthrough emerged, not from the air, but from two mobile phone engineers who thought they could work out where the Kims were when they made their last calls. We knew that if they had been in our network, there might have been a trace of where they were. So my coworker Eric called the uh, San Francisco Police Department. He offered to say, if you give us their phone number, we can look for them. They claim police initially dismissed what would turn out to be a vital lead. When my colleague Eric uh, you know, came over to tell me about all of this that he had uh, basically gotten hung up on by uh, San Francisco Police Department, you know, offering help, not saying that we had anything, but just offering help, they just blew him off. Back in the freezing wilderness, James Kim realized that time was almost up. Having reckoned that the nearest town was just over six kilometers away, he would walk there and get help. Either way, he agreed to be back by 1 p.m. James was very strong. He was our protector. He had always been my protector. 
James! And I realized that he had forgotten his umbrella. He had this black umbrella I had bought him before we went camping one weekend. I love you. Said, I love you again. And he took off and he ran down the trail. He had never failed me. He had a bunch of the children's clothing and he was going to mark the trees whenever there was a fork in the road. Helicopters were still in the skies overhead. As long as they stayed there, there was a real chance he'd be spotted. By air and on foot, search and rescue teams are in a race against time. We have approximately four helicopters up in the air. Three of them are from, uh, been contracted by the family. We got one from the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. But once again, luck was not on James Kim's side. Just as he was struggling alone across the frozen wilderness, a false lead sent rescuers in the wrong direction. We got a lead that James, Katie, and the children had been seen on the coast uh, fueling up at a gas station. The rescue effort was diverted around 150 kilometers away to the coast. With James hiking to find help, his wife and two little girls were on their own. He'd left early in the day and had not returned by 1 p.m. as agreed. It was much scarier without him being there than when he was there. I mean, we were really alone, just myself and two little babies. It was, it was terrifying. It turned dark and then I realized that we had a problem. It was 11 o'clock and he still had not come back. It was so cold and I couldn't imagine what it would be like to spend the night outside of the car without, you know, the comfort of each other and the warmth. I started thinking he's probably not going to come back. James was five years older than me. He had always taken care of me. And so I really trusted him and I really believed him. And I really believed that if he had this plan, it was going to work. There was no way he would leave the girls and I in the car by ourselves for a whole night. I just knew that something had gone terribly wrong. The husband and wife and their two young daughters were last seen eight days ago at this Denny's restaurant in the city of Roseburg, Oregon. No one knows what route the family planned to take. Meanwhile, the mobile phone experts who had offered to trace the Kim's last calls contacted the family directly. They put the Kim's mobile numbers into their system and pinpointed the last that picked up their last call. Rescuers had their first solid lead. They went back to the wilderness around Bear Camp Road, but was it all too late? As soon as we got that cell phone thing, we immediately identified the tower. This antenna covered about 36 miles. That was it. We quickly concentrated all our resources into that. It was the first big breakthrough. The search effort was concentrated within a 58 kilometer radius. But rescue couldn't come soon enough for Katie Kim and her children clinging onto life. My job was still to keep the children alive. 
it became even more, I think, base survival at that time, and it was keep myself and the children alive for as long as I can until somebody finds us. Still unseen on the ground, Katie Kim was desperate, weak, and hungry. Stranded for nine days, their food had long run out. She had tried her best to breastfeed her two little girls, but like her, they were also malnourished and exhausted. It was 30 hours since her husband James had vanished in the freezing forest. She was out of time and out of options. James had set out looking for help. James didn't come back. Now the ball was completely in my court. Now it was my time to act. I decided that I would try and hike out. Okay, good girl. And I would go in a different direction than James had. I strapped Sabine to me. I brought a mirror in case I saw any helicopter or airplane so that I could uh, signal them. It was a massive gamble. She had no idea where to go. The forest looked terrifyingly similar in every direction. We hiked up and around the bend for about only two hours and I was very lightheaded. I was very thirsty. And I started thinking about grapefruit juice and I just felt like I could taste it. And it was so real that I realized that I was having hallucinations. In her weakened state, Katie's mind was playing tricks on her. It was a dangerous sign that extreme dehydration was taking hold. I was physically exhausted. I was hungry. I was dehydrated. Mentally, I was getting very weak. I heard helicopters that were circling around down in the valley below us and I thought maybe they've spotted our car. Katie had to turn around and get back to the car but in her weakened state every step was a struggle. I heard aircraft approaching and I tried to signal them hello hello physically exhausted and depressed I felt like there wasn't much hope anymore just when she had lost all hope stranded mother Katie Kim and her two little girls were spotted at last the helicopter actually turned around finally coming to an end. We 
were discovered. On his own solo mission, a local volunteer pilot, John Rashaw, found Katie Kim and her daughters. After ten agonizing days, they were lifted out of the logging road. At uh, 1.45 today, a helicopter from Carson observed a female in the middle of the road. Can we confirm that it is Mrs. Kim and the two children? But anguish awaited Katie Kim at the heliport when she realized her husband James had not been found. We went from this emotional high to this just devastating low of well, we've only got three we need four footprints were found leading into steep and treacherous terrain fit troopers had survival suits james kim had only been wearing jeans and tennis shoes we did find a an article of clothing that we're trying to determine if it does belong to mr kim we we do believe it is it was an ominous sign. Stripping off clothing is a symptom of hypothermia. Then, the next day, it seemed like a miracle had emerged from the canyon. We heard on the radio that they had located something and they were going to go down and one of them was going to be dropped into the canyon. Everybody that heard that on the radio believed that James was alive. There were high fives, there were tears of joy, there were photos taken. We can now go back to Katie and tell her that we had found James. Found him? Yeah, back where put the medic in. The other ship just found him. But it was a cruel case of miscommunication. It wasn't for about 10 to 15 minutes that the message came across that it wasn't medical really that they were asking for it was a medic for assistance not for medical treatment to James James's best friend, he started walking over to me and he had tears in his eyes and I said, he's dead. And he said, yes. And, you know, it was just, everyone was devastated. There were tears from everybody involved. This horrible, horrible feeling that we weren't able to bring James back to those little girls. And that's what we had promised we were going to do. It, it, just, it just sucked the life out of you. And it was, it was hard. At uh, 12.03 hours today, the body of James Kim was located down in the uh, Big Windy Creek. Um, the news was too much for the sheriff in charge of the search. But Katie Kim couldn't turn away from her mother's worst nightmare, telling her little girls that dad would not be coming home. I pulled Penelope into a room and I don't... I don't remember who else was in the room, but I told her that her dad was not coming back and that he was an angel now, and I asked her if she understood, and she said yes, but 
You know, she was a four-year-old child, so I think all of this was just something that was very difficult to understand. The cause of death to James Kim was exposure with hypothermia. According to Dr. Olson, there were no injuries to the body that would be incapacitating. I'm sure being dehydrated, being out in you know 20 degree temperatures overnight, his body just quit. The pattern of his clothes found scattered on the ground suggested he had walked more than 26 kilometers to get help but he'd been walking in circles. His body was found less than two kilometers from where he'd started. I am totally convinced that he did everything he physically possibly could have done to save his family, and his body just failed him. His mind, I don't think, ever quit. I feel as though James lives on through the children. I mean, I see parts of him and both of them. James would be completely amazed by the children. I mean, he was so proud to be a dad, and he was so proud of the girls. And I think, you know, he would definitely be very, very proud of them. <laughs>